this crowd rises to its feet. But Carl slammed it home. Garland left wing, three ball. Perfect. Garland in front of the lane, locked the only pow. And Allen blocked the shot at the rim. Pow with the left hand and a foul. Welcome to the Chase Down Podcast, part of the Cavs Media Family. I'm your host, Justin Rowan. The Chase Down is presented by Fubo, the official streaming partner of the Cavs. Watch over 350 channels of live sports and TV, including Valley Sports Ohio, without cable. There's no cost and no commitment. Try for free at FuboTV.com slash Cavs. We have finally got answers to what the seeding is going to be. The last time we recorded, the Cavs could have ended up anywhere from two to seven. We got an answer. They are going to be the four seed against the Orlando Magic. And I could not be more excited for playoff basketball to finally be here. I feel like we have been talking about a lot of the same stuff for a while now, trying to figure out what it's going to look like and whatnot. And I'm just so excited for the playoffs playoffs to finally be here you know i like to compartmentalize the regular season and playoffs we're going to do all of that break it down and joining me today is my co-host carter rodriguez carter how you doing buddy i'm doing good um you know it, it was definitely just um one of the more drawn out end of regular seasons i felt in a while you know especially like you know obviously it doesn't go the way you want it to go post all-star break um and like normally you're like you know when when things don't go the way you want post all-star break like in the past with this team it means team just wasn't that good so then you're enjoy you're just not that focused on the wins and losses you're just focused on watching like the young guys develop so this is definitely a bit of a foreign experience um where you know it was hard because there you know we weren't looking for like young development prospects over the last month or so nor did it feel crazy productive to do like these crazy deep dive x's and o's analysis so uh selfishly as a podcaster i'm certainly excited to like get back to like hey we're just gonna spend so much time talking about on-court basketball products Yeah, like there is no breakdown of, hey, here are some macro trends and like we can get to this point. We expect this to normalize. We are now in the small sample size of playoff basketball. And no matter what your form is heading into playoff basketball, as we've seen, it's its own animal, right? It it comes down to matchups. You look at the Eastern Conference. Every single team in the top eight for the Eastern Conference won at least 46 games. There is not going to be an easy matchup in this entire East. Uh, I, I saw some people, you know, talking about the magic, like, oh, you know, like, I, I feel like the Cavs got this one and whatnot. You're going to have to earn it. I think every single team, five through eight, is capable of beating the the team above them, the, the team that they're going to play in the first round. And that includes the Boston Celtics, who I think, you know, have the potential to be the best team in the league. But it's, you know, they're either playing uh, the team that was the second best team in the Eastern Conference uh, prior to Joel Embiid getting hurt in Philadelphia or the Miami Heat, who we know are capable of beating anybody when it gets to this time of year. So I'm incredibly excited. But obviously, the first step in terms of how we got here was the Cavs getting a big win over the Indiana Pacers. We had talked prior to that game about how this was really their last chance to go out there and make a statement, to go out there and beat a quality opponent, you know, uh, try to make some sort of statement prior to the playoffs that helps make us feel a little bit better about where the team is at. And what we got was a wire to wire win. Indiana certainly made it uh, interesting at the end, and and it was nervous clutch time, but the Cavs produced in those moments. They closed out the game and got themselves a signature win. Yeah, I mean, obviously, that was, it was really nice to see. We really want, I, a week and a half ago was pretty sure home court advantage was just not going to happen for this team. Um, And to lock it up with a, to your point, a wire to wire winner, but not a clean wire to wire winner. And like in some ways that felt better because like this was a team that uh to put it kindly was not counter punching particularly well uh yeah. over the last month or so. You know, they'd get hit and then you know you know, be be you know, seeing stars for five straight minutes and teams would go on runs that would run them off the floor. The fact that, you know, Indy came with some punches. Um, especially in that third quarter, you know, got the line a bunch, um, Mobley got in foul trouble and they, they just kind of fought, fought him off, fought him off, fought him off. And like, 
again, I really wanted to see one of those games. You know, I think it actually felt better to win a game like that where Indy was, I thought, playing pretty good basketball and trying their best. And, you know, uh, th- then it would have felt just to blow them off the floor on a, in a game where Indy no-showed. Because, um, yeah, you know, no-shows happen at this time of year. Yeah, and Indy's a team that's been playing really good basketball. I, I believe they've won eight of their last 11 games. Um, you know, that's a very, very potent offense. And for the Cavs, that's been one of the biggest questions is does the offense, you know, have the ability to to rediscover kind of that form that we've seen at other points of the year? And obviously, you know, having Donovan step up in the way that he did, that was encouraging. Seeing them not let Indiana off the hook and, and settle for, you know, um, floating around in the perimeter and not really attacking the rim. The fact that they kept putting that pressure on and attacking the rim and generating good looks, I just really like their offensive flow and execution. And like you said, Indiana pushed back. The Cavs weren't uh, afraid to respond in that moment. And I'll give you a little bit of a preview here, Carter. A little bit of a, a hot take to start off this year podcast. I think the Indiana Pacers are going to beat the Bucks, whether or not Giannis plays. I'm, I'm picking India to win that series. Um, I mean... I think it's certainly possible. You know, I you've been really down on the Bucks all year, so I'm not surprised to hear you say that. Um, you know, I say all year, but uh, I progressively kept getting lower and lower, uh, and some uh, of it, some of it is to bo- bother our buddies that are Bucks fans. Let's be honest, but yeah, they haven't been playing great basketball, and you know that Giannis injury. Uh, obviously, w- whether he either misses the series or isn't at 100%, that's definitely going to be a factor. But, um, you know, I just feel like one team is trending in one direction and the other is, is certainly going in the other. Yeah, I mean, the Pacers have been the fourth best team in the league after the All-Star break. 16-10 and 10 plus 6.6 net rating. Um, you know, they kind of they had that meteoric hot start where it was like, oh, man, maybe, you know, they, they get to the in-season tournament final you know, you, you, you feel like they're going really nuts. Then Halliburton goes through this. The fact that Halliburton's been in an extended downstretch and they're still that good is obviously very, very scary. I think the, one of the reasons you you might pick Milwaukee in that series is that Halliburton's going through an extended downstretch. But, yeah. you know, um, it's one of those things where you look at the net ratings post-All-Star break. Um, the You know, the Cavs are the four seed. Uh, and, and we're minus 3.6. We're 22nd in the league in that rating. The Magic are 8th. You go uh, look at the Bucks. They are 16th in that rating. The The Pacers are 4th. The Miami Heat, who are either the 7th or the 8th seed, are the 6th best team since the All-Star yeah. break. The Philadelphia 76ers have won their last 8 games. Like, it is, well, it's, thing, it's Carter, a crazy like, bracket, man. Every single team outside of the Boston Celtics is looking at their record right now saying we are a better team than that. And the reason that we've lost this many games is due to injuries. The Bucks are saying that the Cavs are saying that the Knicks can say that obviously, you know, Indy and Orlando is going to say that Philly is going to say that Miami is going to say that. And despite that, each of these teams won 46 games. Like, I, I think that goes to show you just how good and competitive this Eastern conference is going to be. And I, I think you know, barring something unexpected happening in the play-in, because anything can happen in single elimination basketball, um, I, I think all four matchups are, are just going to be spectacular. Wouldn't and it be really hard such to comedy if the Hawks uh, somehow <laughs> just just wormed their way into the postseason? That, That's that the thing. People are just assuming it's Philly and Miami, and I'm like, it's a one-game sample, man. Trey Young Look, might drop 50. Miami like almost lost, right? Like yeah. they almost didn't make it out of the play. And Max Drews didn't have that, you know, radioactive fourth quarter. And, you know, it's, I, I think obviously we talked a little bit about the Indiana game, but my main takeaway other than just being very happy for the Cavs to beat a team that is playing great basketball right now, that wanted to win that game, that, that there was a lot of stakes assigned to that and the Cavs rising to the occasion, seeing them lock in on both ends of the floor. The thing that was most encouraging outside of all of that was the fact that Donovan Mitchell had as good of a game as he did. And I think the most significant part is not only how well he played and how productive he was offensively, it's that it had only been one day off since he had last played. Because when we saw him have that that good game against Memphis, it's okay, he hasn't played in four days. Uh, obviously, he's going to be able to kind of rest and recover, and he's going to look fresh. But for him to have a quicker turnaround time and look even better than he did against Memphis, 
to me, that's really, really encouraging. And honestly, where I'm at right now, let me know if you agree or disagree with this. But if Donovan is getting healthier, he's going to have these five days off and just we've seen this kind of progressive upward trajectory. If he's at this level, to me, all of a sudden, it's back to the regular expectations that we had, which was to win a round of the playoffs and be competitive in, in the second round and, and try to, to win a second round series. Because if Donovan's healthy, everybody else, yeah, they're, they're banged up or, or a little bit fatigued. The, the fatigue shouldn't be a factor. You're getting time off and everything else is going to come down to execution. If Mitchell's healthy, it's going to come down to execution because nobody's 100% when you get to the playoffs. Um, so is, is, the, is the question whether that's still the fair expectation? The, the question is, do you feel the same way? That if, hey, Mitchell's looking healthier, you know, it's just going to come down to ex, uh, execution and we can kind of reinstall those expectations that, that we had as the goal for this season. I mean, I never uninstalled that goal, uh, in fairness. I still, I think no matter what, where, where the team's been from a health perspective, from a form perspective, that that's kind of been the, the bar that needs to be cleared for the season to be considered a success. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the, the basketball world doesn't really give you much time for context. If you, if you're not, you know, even, even with all the context, I think that's still been kind of the functional, uh, you know, uh, minimum requirement, I think, for this team to feel. And, and I feel like they've told you as much, uh, yeah. you know, with their, with their post-game comments after they clinched and, and all that fun stuff. Um, and uh, so so I don't think that those expectations should be, the, that goal, the, that standard should be recalibrated. With that said, I'm still less confident than you know i would have been a month ago that they were going to be able to achieve that goal mm -hmm. um i think you know i i think that they they you know and, and we're going to do a much more thorough orlando preview uh before game one uh yeah. where we where we can dive in a little bit more at least we hope to um but i am a really really big fan of what that team's doing um, I think they are a tough matchup for this current iteration of the team. Um, and some of our best tools against them are not available to us right now. So mm -hmm. I, I am, I think it's going to be a really, really tough series. Um, and you know, it's just, this team needs Donovan at near his best form. They need Darius near his best form and like, they might get that, and like you know, if I if I get uh you know if if they just run through Orlando in the first round and Darius and Donnie go nuts, then you know I think I'll, I'll probably look a little doomy. But I just I just want to see it first, um, because those guys have just been so you know up and down with their health and their form, you know, uh, since the All Star break. And again, you know, uh, in in Orlando, you know, talk about. Uh, the, the the team struggled last year in the postseason because New York was able to just muddy up the game. Well, trust me, Orlando loves the mud. The number it's... one defense in the league post-All-Star break. Size, positional versatility, uh, point of attack defense for the guards. They got every tool in the bag to make this an ugly series. And, you know, I, I, I can't help but have, have some re residual angst. On the back Carter. end of that, Carter, you're going to be shocked. I'm ready to love again. I'm I ready know to you be are, hurt. buddy. I'm bought in. I'm good to go. Like I said, Donovan looking the way that he has has given me a lot more confidence. But it's not just him, right? Like Max had been dealing with that knee issue for a while now, and for him to, you know, he's been playing some, great. For him to get some time off, he's now tied for seventh uh, among Cavs all-time triple-double leaders um, with his first one tonight. But he's played 17 games since the All-Star break. He's shooting 41% from three. George Niang, 29 games since the All-Star break. He's shooting 42% from three. Like, you're starting to get those guys that, you know, you count on to be ready when the games matter the most. They're ready. They're rounding into form. Like the, the role guys are, are looking terrific. And, and with Donovan looking, you know, as good as he has, that's really encouraging. I've been a little down on how Jared Allen has been playing lately, just because you can tell he's so fatigued and you're not feeling him on defense the same way. 
I felt him against Indiana. He was awesome against Indiana. That, he was great against a... Charlotte tonight and, you know, in the minutes he did play. Yeah, like that's the kind of stuff that gives me confidence. And, and for Darius, obviously, this has been like a season from health for him that, that he's been working through all this kind of stuff. But for him to hit those big shots against three Indiana. Three or four from three in the fourth. I, I, I thought that that was really, really encouraging. And, and, you know, you just hope. Like, from a kind of situation standpoint, this is what we wanted. We wanted home court. We wanted this extended period of time at home in Cleveland to, to rest, recover, and get ready for this playoff series. And I just feel like they are rounding into form and they're able to, uh, you know, start this series on the right foot. And you know what? I, I think people have already, like I, I've seen people forecasting what future playoff series are going to be in the Eastern Conference. And frankly, I find that disrespectful. Like, like I said, I think every team that is five through eight is capable of winning that first round series. This Eastern Conference is too good to do that. You're going to have to play really well and beat uh, whoever is across from you. No one's going to roll over and just give you a series. And you're right to point out that Orlando is built to kind of stress test the Cavs to, uh, you know, attack. Kind of feel like a Knicks course. light, <laughs> to be right. honest. There's a lot of parallels there with the Knicks, and we'll, we'll kind of get into some of those season numbers and, and where you know it's similar and where it's differed compared to last year. But I want the Cavs to be tested against that. If you know everything goes chalk and the Cavs play a second round series against Boston, that's the gold standard. That's what we're trying to you know measure ourselves up against i want to push boston i want to have a competitive series against them i but you're going to have to beat orlando and you're going to have to play really well to do so so you know if they come out of a series against the orlando magic and they've taken care of business and you feel good about your performance absolutely i'm going to feel good about how we play against boston because we always play boston really well um you know that's that's going to be a lot of fun but for me like i'm not looking ahead i'm looking at orlando and i want to see the Cavs tested against the best teams and i think this is the most interesting possible test that we could have had uh, among the likely matchups in the first round yeah i mean i still like well i don't know if that's i don't know if i agree with that i think really you know, there. I think all the potential outcomes. And I would like to just talk about, you know, the perspective roads and, uh, you know, which ways like we felt felt broke well for the Cavs, yeah. which ways we didn't. Um, uh, but you know, I think all the perspective first round opponents had their own kind of you know interesting learning, you know, potential learning from. You know, with Orlando, it's are they are we going to get drug into the mud or are we going to trust our offense and are we going to be able to execute on that side of the ball? and win a fist fight uh with mm -hmm. with indiana it was going to be hey can we can we you know can we impose our style on them or are they gonna are they just gonna run us out of the gym you know i thought i thought the Cavs did a nice job against in, that with indiana most of the year um uh with with uh with the sixers it's like the ultimate test of you know what's Embiid's health and and how do the double bigs, you know, hold up in that setting? Like, if there's ever a matchup yeah. to need two seven footers that are really great, it's that one. And then Miami, of course, it's the Spo, uh, the Spo monster. So I think I think all of the all of the outcomes were interesting. All the outcomes would have learned something, you know. Uh, but going into this, we kind of thought that you're either gonna, you know, be in the two three and play, you know, a in and play like and you know if if it had landed with them in the two or the three and they played an indie uh and then you know uh probably a new york um mm -hmm. from there do you would you have preferred that road or would you have preferred what we got which is orlando um in a series that the Cavs are definitely going to be favored in um mm -hmm. and i think already are uh per yeah, some per sports books uh, and then, you know, going up against the juggernaut, you know, the best, you know, a historically good regular season team. What what yeah, do you so feel feel like you were going to learn more from? You're, you're going to be shocked here, Carter. I'm going to sit on the fence just a little bit. Um, what I wanted, like, I think my preferred matchup would have been Indiana. Yeah, me Indiana too. scares me um, because of what they're capable of doing offensively. But 
from a Cleveland standpoint, I feel like the Cavs would be more likely to rediscover their offensive form against Indiana because of the lack of, you know, real resistance that you feel on the other end. And that would be very helpful for them to, you know, rediscover their form overall. I wanted an offensive running start. (laughs) Yeah, right. Like you, you want to not be dealing with that. But, you know, um, and then obviously getting to play the Knicks in, in the second round, potentially, I, I want to beat them, right? Like I want to play them. I, I'm enticed by that matchup and I, I want to, you know, acquit, uh, acquit ourselves there and, and like conquer some of those demons and whatnot. But, you know, the other part of me is excited for this Orlando matchup. Like, I think that this is a really, really damn good team. They're a team that's going to challenge the Cavs, but they're a team that I feel like Cleveland is well designed to defend. Like, I, I feel like Orlando's going to have a tough time on the offensive end of the court. And this is really going to be a competitive series because of Orlando's ability to do the same thing to Cleveland, right? Like, I, I think it is going to be a muddy and ugly series. But it's also a series where, at least if you're going to look at the regular season sample, the Cavs have been able to generate good offense against Orlando at times this year. So it's really going to come down to, do they trust their system? Do do they execute? or Do they get baited into some of their worst habits and tendencies? That, to me, just intellectually as a fan, I find that fascinating. And even though it's the tougher test and the tougher road, I want the Cavs to be tested. Like, that. that's what I really want. Like, Nothing would have been different about what the Cavs' strengths and weaknesses were last year if they beat the Brooklyn Nets in the first round. We might have not felt the same, you know, sense of urgency about addressing whatever issues are there with the team. Right now, I want as many valuable data points as I can get. And playing a team that, you know, stylistically presents challenges for the Cavs and the Cavs having a tougher path in the playoffs this year, in a season where we've kind of been deprived of useful data points, I feel like it, as long as we're, we've rounded into, you know, decent health here, we might actually get some actionable data based on what we see in this year's playoffs. Yeah, I just don't know if there is a, a, a quote unquote easier road. I mean, I guess by default, if you get out of the first round, they have the hardest road now because <laughs> Boston yeah. is the best team in the league uh, by every metric. Um, so like in that sense, it is the wins. hardest road. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but like, I, I, I think... I think I'm a little less worked up about it as, as everyone else because my kind of expectations are much more around getting out of that first round. And, um, you know, I, you know, I, th- I think I would have been fine with pretty much any of these opponents, you know, like uh, any of those four uh, prospective teams that I mentioned, I think I could have been on board with a matchup and learning something. The only thing I really didn't want was Miami just because they, you know, Sometimes they can just Miami you and you don't learn anything. <laughs> and like, that's really, again, all I ever want. And like, if you're someone who listens to Spot a lot, all I want is actionable data. Um, yeah. Whether it's fun data or bu- a bummer data, I want data. And uh, uh, I, I and I think you're going to learn a lot about this team in this first round and, you know, uh, and ideally onward. But, um, you know, I, I think it, it is going to be fun. I do think this team is going to be tested uh, immediately. So like, if you, if you're of the opinion, you know, if you are of the opinion, like, oh, phew, we didn't have to play, uh, Philly or Miami. I I would, I would hesitate. I would tell you to, to bring that exhale right back in and hold on to your breath because I think we're in for a tough, tough series. Uh, maybe I wouldn't think they were in for as tough of a series if Orlando hasn't been playing so well and we haven't been struggling so much, but like Mm -hmm. the reality is, that is where we are and like there are no there there is no gimme here yeah like orlando's a team that's capable of beating you know miami or philadelphia in a playoff series right like i i don't know if i would pick them but i i think that they are like that caliber right i i think they are one of many teams that could beat any team in the eastern conference given the right matchup right so like you said we're going to be getting some valuable data points we're going to be challenged we're going to be tested we're going to be tested in areas that we've improved this season but can still potentially be a weakness and, and have been, you know, a weakness in some of these games against Orlando. So I'm, I'm just really interested to, to see if we can kind of find consistency, because I think that's really going to be the theme of this playoff series is consistency, because when the Cavs are doing what they do best, 
I think they can execute against this team. I think they can play well, and I, I think they can, you know, win games as a result of it. But, you know, you have to be able to execute at that consistent high level and set that standard, the kind of standard that Zoom sets for this podcast. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Zoom. Half a million businesses connect using Zoom, a single platform for phone, chat, workspaces, events, apps, and video. Zoom enables real-time collaboration for teams around the globe. Zoom, how the world connects. Carter! You know I did stats. I called you a nerd moments ago, but I'm the, the real nerd is me. I, I, until you come and take my crown, I am going to keep that title. The Cavs played Orlando four times this season. They were two and two in those matchups. And one thing I found hard to believe when you know you've played four games against the team in the regular season, the Cavs only had three lineups that played over 10 minutes against the Orlando Magic this season. The most used lineup against Orlando only played 17 minutes. And that was that lineup that, that the Cavs had uh, with Donovan Mitchell, Max Struess, Isaac Okoro, Dean Wade, and Jared Allen. Well, we might uh, not that, see that one. <laughs> we might not see that one because Dean Wade is inactive. But, you know, in the minutes that they did play, they had a plus 36 net rating and a 133.3 offensive rating. The second most used lineup, only played one game, was our current starting lineup. Um, they played 12 minutes against the Orlando Magic. They had a 130 offensive rating and a plus 26. Look up, Dano. Call it. Uh, <laughs> Cavs in four. Uh, so you know what? We're, we're golden. We're, we're fine. That's all it Pod's is. Odds over. Um, in the two games that the, they won against the Magic, the starters were, you know, the current starting five as well as the awesome starting five uh, that – uh, won those games with, with uh, Garland and Mobley out. Uh, the two losses, the starters in those games, one was Garland, Okoro, Struess, Mobley, and Allen. Uh, that was after the All-Star break. You guys probably remember it. And the other one was Garland, Mitchell, Struess, Wade, and Allen uh, w- with Evan Mobley out prior to those Boston games. Yeah, uh, it it feels like there are some games where you feel like you can learn a lot from from them i feel like these ones the lineups were so hard and so up and down and i felt like all these games happened at weird times for both teams i it, i I'm, feel like i'm not going to pull as much as i think we probably should have pulled from the Knicks series last year where we we're like hey every time we play new york they seem to make us play hideous basketball like yeah. like i don't know if that's necessarily been the case here like the the outcomes have been so diverse the personnel on the floor have been so diverse it it's it's hard to and and you know and then obviously the Dean Wade thing is a bit of the, an elephant in the room for me because he is our big wing guy, you know right. he has consistently been our big wing guy and Orlando is just chock full of big wings, you know <laughs> uh, absolute mashers in Franz Wagner and Paolo Bencaro and Evan Mobley only can guard one of those guys at a time, um yeah. and you know it'll be interesting uh and this goes to show uh I, i'm glad the nba played all their games at once but it did make researching this really hard because i had to parent all day and didn't have any time to do research so i'm going to come back but in today's game they started jonathan isaac at the five mm-hmm. and i i am going to be very very interested uh in getting a sense of what they're going to do with the big position because one thing starting Isaac at the five. Isaac has been amazing. He's been an all defense caliber player. If he if he one played of the enough best defensive players in the league, by, and, by and wide boy does the eye test match that every time I watch them play. Um, however, if they go kind of centerless, then all of a sudden the Cavs get to put Jared Allen on one of those one of the, those two mega stars, or just let Jared Allen help off of Jonathan Isaac, who is not. A crazy threat from three um whereas you know a guy like franz wagner or winter or i'm sorry uh mo wagner uh who Cavs fans now hate because of that, that game that loss uh or or uh wendell carter jr two two spacing threats and or or mash threats in the case of wagner or in case of mo like you can't really do that so it'll be really interesting to see kind of where orlando goes with the personnel but like that l- they found some stuff in the post All Star break, and you know, th- again, the personnel has just been so different for both teams. I feel like I'm not quite sure where where they're going to go. You know, the the yeah. ma- the battle lines are less less clear to me. 
Yeah, you know, it's going to be very murky in terms of what this is going to look like because you're talking about such small sample sizes. And, you know, I did mention that there were three lineups that that played at least 10 minutes against Orlando this season. Uh, the third was not as productive for the Cavs. That was Garland, Mitchell, Struess, Wade, and Tristan Thompson. And we had talked about it uh, before, um, after that, that Mo Wagner game, where people were saying, oh, you know, Tristan wasn't there. The rebounding was not good with Tristan against Orlando. That lineup had a negative 43.3 net rating, and they gave up 50% of all potential offensive rebounds. They they only collected 50% of their defensive rebounds in those matchups. Um, But you're right. Like, the... How it looked against Orlando this season is very different than how it looked last year against the Knicks. Last year against the Knicks, you look at the Cavs offensive rating where it ranks against other Knicks opponents, and they were 24th out of 29 teams that played New York this year. Against Orlando, the Cavs actually have the fifth best offensive rating against the Magic this season. Um, They had a 118.7 offensive rating against Orlando. Uh, In the games that they won, uh, they actually had a 127.3 offensive rating and did and had the second best defensive rebounding percentage against the Magic this season. Uh, They collected 76.3% of their defensive rebounds in their losses against Orlando. The Cavs had a 109.7 offensive rating, which out of out of losses against the Magic, that's still the fifth highest offensive rating out, out of all opponents that they've had but they had the fourth worst defensive rebound percentage in those games, which is 65.6%. So you can already see kind of some of those familiar trends of the Cavs are capable of defensive rebounding at a high level against this team. They are capable of scoring at a high level against this team, and it's going to come down to execution. And obviously the first thing I looked at as well, uh, after looking at those rebounding numbers is the pace. Orlando plays at a, a slower pace than Cleveland, um, but 28th those win- post All Star break, 95 possessions a game. I, I believe they were around that for the season as well. Uh, in the wins uh, for Cleveland, the pace was 97.5, not far off of, of their season number, not far off of the Magic season number. Um, and then in those losses, the pace was 92.25. So dramatically slower, uh, almost like the, those fourth quarters that we've seen recently where it just is making things so difficult. And when you're playing a defense as good as Orlando, making sure that you have tempo in your offense, I think is going to be one of the most important things. Yeah, well, you're going to have to have tempo. And I do think maybe we should just do a little bit of like a Orlando primer. You know, I... I I know a lot of our uh, uh, listeners are probably not watching a ton of Orlando, but you, uh, it's primer, not primer, right? Did you do that no, on it's, purpose? It's primer. Is it? Yep. Oh my goodness! It's a British. Uh, I, at least that's the way I heard a British person say it once, and they made up the language. So, um, uh, so anyway, uh, please in the chat correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I'm not going to read it. Um, I think it's important to just talk about the way Orlando wins. Uh, on offense, they win by grinding down and getting to the freaking free throw line. They are mashers. They are there are high free throw rate teams that are grifters. There are high free throw rate teams that are mashers. They fall into the latter category. Justin, who led the league uh, pre All Star break in free throw rate? I'm guessing the Orlando Magic. Correct. Who led it in post All Star break? Orlando Magic? You're damn right they did. Uh, They are a team that really relies on that free throw rate. They, I believe they're dead last in the league in total made threes this year. Um, They have guys who can shoot, but they don't have a lot of, you know, Max Struces or Niangs that are just going to get up seven, eight shots. And and even even, and Paolo and Franz, their two best players, also shaky three-point shooters. They have streaky to, to, guys. To add to your point, yeah, to add to your point, they're 26th in three-point frequency in terms of the volume of shots that they take, and they're 25th in mid-range shot frequency. Number one, in rim shot frequency. So they do not take shots anywhere but the rim in, in terms of volume. Yeah, and the other way they do that is by... Uh, by turning teams over. Post All Star break, they lead the league in uh, opponent tur- turnover percentage. Uh, they they turn teams over on just under sixteen percent of their possessions. So it's like the Cavs are going to have an interesting line that they have to toe here, where you know a lot of slow paced teams that also reflects in their defensive philosophy, which is we're just going to keep everything in front of us. We're going to burn shot clock, and we're going to hope you take a bad shot over time. 
That is not this Magic team. They are event defenders. They are guys who fly over every dribble handoff and stay attached to your back hip. They're poking at every pass. And, you know, they they are a team that um, gets their buckets by getting into transition or getting into semi-transition, getting size mismatches, and then mashing those. So, yes, the Cavs have to play fast uh, if, if they want to, if they want to, you know, kind of control the, the, the identity of the game, but that they can't lose control. They can't get careless and reckless and start turning the ball over because it's really, if you really look at it, getting those mismatches early is really in, in drawing fouls is really Orlando's only road to a, a strong offensive outing on most games. Paolo can hit a mid-ranger. Sometimes a guy like Suggs or Cole Anthony get really, really hot from three. But, like, that's not how they win. They win by putting on the clamps, pressuring the ball, getting turnovers, getting out and running, and then mashing size mismatches, which they have a lot of those because they're just they're big and strong across the board. Yeah, and, and, you know, if you're looking for areas where, you know, as you evaluate how styles make fights um the gap in three-point frequency I, I think is going to be one of those key things to look on like the Cavs are going to need to get those three-pointers up um you know talked about how, how the magic are 26 in terms of how many uh threes they take at what frequency uh the Cavs are seventh seventh most uh, th- uh threes taken per game from a uh, shot distribution standpoint uh Cavs take even fewer mid-range shots they took the second fewest mid-range shots out of any team in the league and they're 12th in shots at the rim. So the Cavs have kind of transitioned from such a rim-heavy team. Even though it is still a big part of their shot diet, they take a lot more threes this year. And uh, Orlando has been good at times, suppressing the number of attempts that the Cavs have had it against them, uh, particularly in those wins that they've had. So that's going to in be... In wins, they've taken 36 threes a game against the Magic. In losses, they have taken 31. Yeah, and, and I think one of those wins, we we only took th- uh, 22 as well. Yeah, so they had a crazy <laughs> high volume. It was the Sam Merrill game. Yeah, right. So, you know, we're going to need to make sure that that is part of the diet because when you're playing a team that's going to generate second chance opportunities at a high level, even if you do a good job on the defensive glass, it's going to happen. They are going to generate second chance opportunities and they do a good job generating turnovers as well. You need to find variance that that's in your favor. And and I think the the three point line is obviously going to be a big part of that taking care of the basketball, because that's an aspect that's a little more under your control uh, is is going to be a key, but you know, here's another, here's another spot where they control variance. They do not give up offensive rebounds. They're the best defensive rebounding team in the league uh, post all-star break. They are again, they're just big and they're, and they don't play fast which means that they don't have to have a got a lot of guys leaking out. You know, you can just have Franz or Paolo or Isaac or or Vog or uh, or Mo or even Suggs and Fultz who are really really good guard rebounders. And Cole Anthony's a good guard rebounder. So they yeah. they have a lot of guys that are hanging around their own basket after teams get up shots and in in finishing off possession. So again, like in a lot of ways, it is going to be a possession battle, and and that's why you can't turn the ball over because you're not going to get that shit back. <laughs> you know, yeah. like they're gonna, they're just gonna, they're just gonna. Uh, it's going to be a, a battle of attrition over time, and that's going to be really hard to overcome. They're not a crazy good offensive rebounding team. They're not like a bad offensive rebounding team, but they're middle of the pack this year. This is not like the the Knicks last year where they were. They spent the entire regular season kicking the crap out of everyone on the boards. Uh, mm-hmm. on the offensive board specifically they're okay you know but that that is not what they hang their hat on because they want to get back on defense yeah and, and i think the other important thing is for the Cavs to take care of business at home like i i think when you look at differences between last year's first round series and this one the knicks have had had playoff experience those, those were guys jalen brunson has been in playoff runs they as a team had been on playoff runs josh hart had been uh you you know he he's a, a playoff performer like that was a team with some experience. Orlando doesn't have that. Orlando does not have playoff experience outside of like Joe Ingles. Um, and the Cavs, you know, they have it. They have brought in more when it comes to Max Bruce and George Niang. They have the experience to draw on from last year. I mean, you look at 
the Knicks' first playoff experience, like what, what Julius Randle went through and all that, like when, when they, you know, lost it in the playoffs in five games, like it was a negative experience. But all experience is good experience when, when you have something to draw on when it when it comes to the postseason, and the Cavs have a, a another advantage here, which is that the Orlando Magic are not a good road team. Uh, they have a 110.4 offensive rating on the road. They really struggle there, and they're very good at home. In all likelihood, like you're going to want to w- take one of those games in Orlando. Um, it, it's very possible that Orlando steals one in Cleveland as well. Like my biggest concern, honestly, is foul trouble because they are going to be taking it to the rim so frequently. And we saw in the game against Indiana when Evan Mobley got in foul trouble, that's when Indiana got back into the game. That's when they started getting a little bit more comfortable. So if Mobley gets into foul trouble, that can change the complexion of one game. And I don't and think we, they have, I don't think, sorry to interrupt, but I don't think they have great answers for that on their roster right now. I'm a, I'm going to assume no Dean Wade, just yes. based on the reporting, and be pleasantly surprised if I see him, um, just because that feels more reasonable. And like, you know, you're thank goodness they picked up Marcus Morris. This is a good Marcus Morris series. This is great Marcus this Morris This is series. a good Marcus Morris series. Um, it's important uh, that, that I, I feel like he's going to get minutes here. Um, you know, it might be a Tristan Thompson series, depending, um, you know, depending on on that foul trouble, but like with no Dean, you are really going to rely on Marcus Morris. And this is where, you know, Tristan being a little up and down, uh, and you know, Damian Jones, not, not being someone who's consistently being able to give you minutes when, when you do run with Mobley as your, you know, kind of permanent backup five, it mm-hmm. does leave you more exposed to foul trouble than other than other series. I do think a playoff style basketball kind of plays in your favor there. Yeah. The officiating kind of changes over the course of the season play in your favor there where you're not petrified that you're going to get ticky tack. And again, this is not a grifter team. And it's really important to say that because we complain a lot about players who, you know, we think are picking up fouls in unseemly ways. I, I don't think that is what the Orlando Magic do. Like, Paolo has some tricks, don't get me wrong, but he also puts his shoulder into your chest and tries yeah. to score buckets. So If they're letting the Cavs go straight up, like, that does play into their favor. Yeah. But, like, we saw last year what a difference in how small the margins can be because, you know, Josh Hart hits the game winner in game one. Nick Steele home court. Exhausting. I hated it. It sucks. But then you have game four where, you know, Darius has that awesome second half and and the Cavs have the lead and you're feeling good. And then Mobley gets into foul trouble in that game. And because they didn't have a Tristan Thompson, they didn't have another option to go to. They kind of lost control of that game and lost their opportunity to extend that series. That might happen in Orlando. You might have one of those games where, hey, we're, we're about to steal one from the Magic. Maybe we won both of them in Cleveland, but we're about to take one against Orlando and we get into foul trouble and you lose that opportunity. So taking care of business at home, I think, is going to be really important. And the one name you didn't mention when you're talking about where this might be an important series is we got one guy that isn't a big but has shown that he can defend some of Orlando's guys that, that can generate rim pressure, particularly Paolo Bancaro, and that's Isaac Okoro. Last time we played the Magic, Okoro guarded Paolo for extended stretches of that game. Paolo went two for 10 with Okoro guarding him. And if you're able to have Isaac disrupting Paolo's dribble and his ability to get to the rim with the bigs or just one of the bigs even able to provide that kind of help defense, I think you can trust your defensive infrastructure in those spots. And if Paolo is going to, you know, try to take those shots over Okoro and whatnot, I will live with him taking, you know, contested mid-range jumpers over a shorter defender versus their bread and butter, which is getting to the rim. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, Paolo could not be more of a different player than Jalen Brunson physically. But, you know, it, it almost feels like the same conversation we had last year, which takes me to the onus of doing that, which is, if you're going to play Isaac heavy minutes, uh, which, you know, especially, you know, when one of the bigs is off the floor, well, the offense has got to hold up. You know, Isaac has been in a pretty big shooting slump over the last month. I think he's around 25% uh, oh, from three. Back today. I'm, I'm I know, in. baby. I know. It moved me. It moved me. <laughs> I know. But, uh, but, you know, like the offense has to be good where, you know, 
the team just got brutalized uh, publicly for, you know, or, you know, and Brunson got so much love in last year's playoffs for all those tough mid rangers he hit. And, you know, we can scream all we want about efficiency and points per possession and defensive rating. It's going to feel like a backbreaker if the offense isn't able to run. And that's the thing that's going to be tough because I think this Orlando team is as well constructed to muck up the Cavs offense as maybe any team in the league, uh, yeah. especially uh, if Donovan and Darius are not in, in good form and, 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 you know, relatively healthy. So it's going to be a, a series of tough choices. The nice thing is that JB has more choices, even with Dean banged up, even with, uh, you know, Sam Merrill banged up. He's and poor, Craig Porter Jr., who like oh, yeah. cranked the crap out of his ankle, and I don't know how long that's going to be. He's going to be out, and you know he's not someone you expect to be in the rotation anyway. But you know, with 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 Dean and Merrill both um, banged up, you still have more levers to pull. You know, JB had to go to the Danny Green uh, lever pretty early <laughs> in, yeah. in the in the playoffs last year. He's got more guys this year that he can use to kind of change the tenor you know the thing that's going to be tough is all those guys you know add something and all those guys take something away so it's going to be you know like george is going to add spacing but you know do you do you just get mashed by the orlando offense when he's on the floor i do not like this series for george niang by the way i was, didn't I was like actually, the... I, I want i i know you were just kind of going off for a little bit so if you want me to stall <laughs> oh, so you can take interrupt me water, baby ahead. interrupt but... me baby I, I was curious about how you felt about this series for George, like whether or not it's a decent enough matchup, because the one thing when you compare this to an Indiana uh, potential series, Indiana, it's going to be, okay, they're going to test us at the point of attack. Halliburton can get going, even though he's been in a bit of a slump. They've got a lot of willing shooters. Uh, Neesmith is, is, you know, a, a terrific kind of wing that's able to, to put pressure on the rim and shoot from three. This that's not really the case with Orlando. Like their guards, like J- Jalen Suggs. Like we talked about how good Jonathan Isaac is defensively. Suggs is one of the best guard defenders, and he's someone that's going to make life very difficult for whoever he's guarding on the offensive end. But him and Gary Harris, Mar- Markel Fultz, they're not going to test the Cavs' point of attack defense as much. And I'm wondering if you think that that kind of leaves an opening for George to to have you know, a, an impact in the series, because even though the Orlando bigs might be able to, you know, take advantage of him, if Isaac's rotating down to take Palo in kind of those staggered lineups and George is out there as the spacing four, I think that there's spots where, where you can kind of have him and he, he could have an impact, a positive impact on the series. I mean, he, he absolutely could. I don't want to be like overly like, um, you know, overly, uh, sure about any of this you know i yeah. just look at where i think george is best is when he's pulling a slower plotting big away from the rim um or he is or the Cavs are consistently able to get two on the ball and mm-hmm. get teams into rotation and because orlando is so freaking good at the point of attack with Suggs, with Fultz, with harris with isaac um they they're not often having to put two on the ball they're not often having to get into crazy scramble rotations they they can do it and but like so you know you're not getting that and when the when jonathan isaac takes two steps off of him or franz wagner takes two steps off of niang those guys are so good and athletic that they can close out so Mm. you know you're not getting a lot of the the you know the 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 stretch advantage is there and i just worry on the other end where you know you turn the ball over and george is and, and you know franz wagner catches the ball with a head of steam and oftentimes especially in those bench units george is gonna be guarding guys like franz wagner <laughs> and like that's a rough matchup for him i'm i'm as i'm about as big of a franz wagner fan as you'll as you'll find i just love his game and i was i've cooled i've become a little bit I, of a hater i understand but... i understand uh he he got the nba twitter blessing which is your the number one way for you to hate someone yeah, um I, but <laughs> that's that just automatically triggered in my head i'm like are we sure he's not just german tobias harris like what, what are we doing here and i'm a tobias harris i guy like too, the... so that's not slander but i i think from a like a style of 
play standpoint. I don't agree like, with that at all. I think he plays with oh, so I much more force. I think he goes comes comes to the rim with so much force. Um, and you know he's one of those guys because he's so big. He's six eight. That when you attack with force and you're not a terrible athlete, you just get easier angles for layups. Where it's like, sure. oh, I conceivably was in the right spot, but he's six eight, six nine, and and you know launched towards the hoop with with momentum and like Mm -hmm. that just gets you cleaner looks um you know so i i just think i think it's a rough series for niang i think there's a real world where we see a lot of marcus morris early on or you know by game two game three if the niang men's don't go well uh again i think how well niang functions in this series probably has more to do with what the guards are able to do than what george is able to do you know, if yeah. the guards in are terms beating of how they're setting them up and whatnot. yeah, if the guards are getting the defense into rotation, Niang will be a, a, a helpful player. If Niang is catching the ball without advantage a lot, then, yeah. you know, what are you going to, you know, you're just not getting what you need out of him. And if that's happening, then you need to find someone who can pr- provide other skills. You know, you, you're going to have to find ways to win in other ways, which is where, a Dean Wade is really valuable where, uh, where a, where a Marcus Morris, if, if he's in form is helpful. So I I think it's a tough matchup for him. Uh, I think, and and frankly, even if Morris isn't giving you great minutes, part of me just thinks I just, I just downshift. I just get a little faster and try to get into my, my offense a little quicker with some guys who can run more Isaac and Struess at the three and the four uh, on some of those minutes and just say, well, hope we can hold off, <laughs> hold him off at the rim, because uh, because I I just again I just don't think because again I don't think Niang is giving you a ton of rim uh, deterrence either. So I mean again it, I there's a lot of roads up the mountain here, and like the way I'm playing this out in my head could be very very different from what happens. Yeah, and you know when we're looking at the regular season, we're talking about limited data points too. Um, he, I think having the veteran presence of guys like Niang and Struess is going to make a big difference in this series. Uh, when you look at um, the on-off splits against the Orlando Magic this year, the two guys that made the biggest difference for the Cavs offense were Max Struess and George Niang. Uh, the offense was 11 points better with, with Struess on, uh, nine points better with George on. Uh, every single Cavs player uh, or almost every Cavs player had a positive net rating this season against the uh, the Magic. Uh, Mitchell was plus 12.4. Uh, Tristan was plus 12. Struess was plus 12. Allen plus 11. Mobley plus 8. Garland plus 8. Um, the only guys that were negative in their minutes a- against the Magic were, were Sam Merrill, Dean Wade. Uh, both of them were, were at minus 3. And poor Karis LeVert. Karis only played 27 minutes against the Magic. I think that was only one game. Uh, but he was a minus 22.3 in those minutes. But again, only 22 minutes. Um, Our pets' heads com- are falling off. I saw yeah. an interesting comment in the chat, by the way, just to put a button on the Niang conversation. F- Fog uh, in the live chat just said, or just match Niang's minutes with Ingles. Which, you know, you could do that. Um, I'm interested to see how many minutes Ingles plays. You know, mm-hmm. they really need him to, like, give their offense a little, you know, volume three-point shooting and playmaking juice. But, you know, obviously he's getting up pretty long in the tooth. So we'll see how many minutes he plays, which takes me to a question for you, Justin. Cavs have been playing eight guys uh, in the games that matter. Mm -hmm. Are they going to play eight guys? Let's assume Wade is not available. So coming off the bench, I I think we're going to see nine. I think we're going to see nine. So Karras, Okoro, Niang, and... Marcus Morris. Okay. I I think we're going to see nine to start this series. And then if we need to tighten up a little bit, we can. That's the problem oh. with eight is you just, you, you just, it's hard to add a body. It's yeah. much easier to take one away. And I honestly, like, I know he had the, the game against Orlando. I think this might be a tough series for Sam Merrill. Uh, what we've really seen is teams that have stout perimeter defenders that don't need to switch every single action and whatnot. 
like their screen navigation is phenomenal. What, what Jalen Suggs can do with Folds, Gary Harris, all these guys, like it's just wave after wave after wave of good perimeter defenders. I just worry about his ability to get free and impact the series. I can certainly see if the Magic are, you know, really muddying things up and we need that spark, we can go to him. I and think maybe... that's, a, that's a break glass in case of emergency. Try to juice yeah. the offense play, if he's even healthy enough to play, by the way. Right, because he has been dealing uh, with, with what JB has described as whiplash, uh, trying to take a charge. Uh, I, I believe it was against Paul George uh, in the Clippers. Um, but yeah, like I, I think maybe that's, you know, matchup dependent, how the game's going, break glass in case of emergency type option. But, you know, I kind of feel like we'll start with nine. And then if we need to kind of tighten up and, and things aren't going as we hope in, in this series, you can go down to eight. Um, I, th- I think I don't I'd think start it goes with... below late. I don't think it goes below eight. No, I think I'd start with nine. One thing I will say is the fact that Okoro and Levert specifically can be high volume pl- or high minute players for this team does help make that a little bit more palatable. Like yeah. they they ran eight against Indiana in a you know a wire to wire you know challenging game that they were really trying to win. What do you think their mi- leading minutes getter uh, had? It was Donovan Mitchell and Jared Allen. They tied. 34? 38. But like okay. 38 in the playoffs is completely fine. It's, it's a nothing. very, very defensible number. Mobley played 29. Garland played 29. Struess played 28. But yeah, then off it the... It feels different if it's three guys that are playing 14 minutes. If you got two guys that are really coming off the bench and playing like that 26, 28 minute um, load like that makes things a whole lot easier because that's that's what you're really kind of trying to keep an eye on is the that minute load for the starters yeah and the only thing that that is hard is you know i always talk about it in the playoffs you need pumpkin insurance and if you go with an eight-man rotation niang can't give you 20 you played 27 in this game you can't have 27 bad minutes from anyone you know that just won't work in the postseason like you need every minute to be serving you uh in some way so like i think you know but again none of you know three of the five starters in that pacers game didn't get to 30 minutes so you have room to steal you know i think if you're gonna run eight you really want at least one of those bench guys to give you like 25 to 30 another one to give you 15 to 20 and another one to give you 10 to 15 and then Mm -hmm. you're at least like you're running a humane rotation at that point, yeah. you're not you're not running a Dan Tony rotation where or a Tibbs rotation where you're where you got someone playing 46 minutes. I don't really think the Cavs are particularly built for. I don't think any of their guys are best served. They don't have any cyborgs really, other than maybe Mobley, that that are that you're not going to really see the effect of 46 minutes on them. Um, yeah. so you know, I, I I think nine is the right choice, and I and but. It, on the other hand of that, JB hasn't really shown us that with this as of late. He's been playing eight. So like there's the there's the should it's versus possible, yeah, the it's possible that I'm wrong about Morris being in Well, the it's mix. not even about being going. right or wrong to me. It's about even if JB JB and the coaching staff might go, Yeah, we'd really like to have nine, but then they look at the fact that they've kind of been prepping the guys to be running eight. And you yeah. go, uh, we just got to run with what we, yeah. we need some continuity in a season that's had none. So we're going to run eight to your, to what I said earlier. I do think it's hard to get up to nine after you start with eight. You know, normally that just ends up being a, you know, you just look, you know, we've watched a lot of playoff basketball. A lot of times that just is a full replacement. Yeah. You know, uh, this guy's not working. Let's just swap him and stay at eight as opposed to just, you know, weaning a guy out of the rotation um i don't know if there's a right or a wrong answer here i i agree with you that i start with nine but it's it's hard no matter what you do playoffs baby playoffs uh i you know we're going to go more depth in depth uh about this magic matchup after we we've had a couple days to to research and try to get a magic guest i feel like we've done pretty damn good off a no no homework though no homework i did some well i didn't do any homework i I admitted it on the front end I was putting on work before the, this year podcast. Uh, the the one last stat I'm going to throw at you because I, I think it is really interesting. And you know, when you're talking about year over year growth and, and where we want to see and these points of emphasis, the impact of Jared Allen and Evan Mobley wasn't there last year. 
against the New York Knicks. Like they did not play well individually. That you didn't feel them against the Knicks, and they weren't really great against them in the regular season. I know Jared basically didn't play against the Knicks in the regular season. The they played two uh, Mobley and Allen played two matchups against the Knicks, a total of thirty one minutes. So again, all of this is coming with the small sample size caveat. But in those minutes, pace was phenomenal. We had a one hundred one pace in their minutes together. I think that's really important when you're playing two bigs. Offensive rating, 129.2 in those 31 minutes. Net rating, 35.3. And most encouraging, when you talk about, you know, second chance opportunities and all that, they got defensive rebounds on 84.4% of possessions. The rebounding was phenomenal with them. The offense was phenomenal. The defense was phenomenal. And the pace was great. That's what you want to see. I want to see them rise to the occasion because if Mobley and Allen are the best big men and front court players in this series, it's over. Like that, that's it, right? Like no matter what the, the magic guards do to, to make things difficult for, for Mitchell and Allen, if Mobley and Allen are out there making life difficult for Paolo and Franz and they're dominating to that kind of extent, the Cavs can feel really good about their chances in this series. Yeah, I, I'm pretty confident they'll do a good job on defense. This is a good matchup for them on that front um, uh, in terms of, you know, Orlando wants to get right to the rim. We're really good at stopping guys right at the rim. Uh, yeah. I think the offensive side of the ball is going to be much, you know, going to be very interesting. Uh, Mobley uh, averaged 15 against Orlando in his three games, uh, shooting 62%. Jarrett only averaged 11, but he shot 70%. Um, but I think their attempts are going to be an interesting bellwether as well. There, like, you know, how much are we going to notice them on the offensive side of the ball, or are they going to fade away a little bit? I mean, Mobley, I think, was really good. I mean, four assists as well against Orlando in his three games or his two games. Sorry, so Mobley's been looking exciting, man. Like, yeah, I, I just I like what I'm seeing out of him, and, and that's probably part of why I'm starting to puff out my chest a little bit here. Yeah, again, I, my chest is uh, is certainly not puffed just yet. You know, it. it it's definitely just kind of, it's just such a weird thing. I just don't feel like I have that much data to play with against this team, you know? Like, to your point, they've looked better against them. This isn't a New York thing where the Cavs have not really been able to get much going against them. They have. They've certainly been able to get stuff going against uh, against this team. And you know, But just, they haven't played great lately. Yeah, but they just have not played great lately. And that is just... You know, I just every time I start to get excited, I just go check that net ratings after the All-Star break and see us in the bottom third of the league. Um, And like I and this is why I think compared to others, I'm a little less worried about who the first round matchup was Uh, at, you know, at the beginning of the day. I wasn't crazy worried about it before any games were played. And I think it's because. I cared a lot about home court because I thought this team needed as much runway as they could get up to the, up to that first game to refresh themselves, get their bodies right, um, get their brains right Mm -hmm. and not have to go and not having to hit the road for that first game. But instead, you know, getting extra time at home, you know, Darius is going to have seven days between games uh, first game is going to be Saturday, so he's going to have seven days between his last game and and this one. Um, like that, that kind of stuff is what I really wanted to see, and you know, I I think they have by getting home court, they did everything they needed to do to get themselves ready to win a first round series this year within reason. They and like. It's still going to be hard. I still have a lot of concerns about health and form and all that fun stuff and in reps. You know, you look at this Orlando team, they've been an exceptionally healthy team. I think they had five guys play over 70 games. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, they have the yeah, continuity. We, we can remove them from my, my little spiel about how every team feels like they're better than the record. Yeah. They are who um, they are. Yeah, they, they pretty much are who they are, but they are also young as hell and fun as hell. Yeah. Um. So... It's gonna... Paolo's a star. Paolo's a star in the making. We we got to see one of the first games of his career uh, on Cavs opening weekend uh, two years, uh, whatever his rookie season was. And that guy's awesome. Like, he's absolutely, he's absolutely on his way to stardom. And, and that's the, the type of talent that 
can you know change the complexion of a series yeah it's it's going to be a, a really fun matchup i'm excited to dive in even further learn more about about kind of what this orlando team can do look look watch some watch some of their games and um really really see uh what what we're up against but uh, they have a lot of fun optionality and they're going to test this team in, in a, a, a a billion different ways well thank you for some sobering analysis and, and you know keeping me in check i think that's really important uh, i'm just riding high right now because i'm walking around good and whatnot but you know what the, there's one thing we need to add one one thing that we absolutely have to bring up before we wrap up this here podcast and that is uh-oh the Cavs are playing playoff basketball <laughs> yeah they let's are buddy go, baby let's, let's avenge go. 2009 i don't want to see any anyone posting a gif of hito turkaloo this week is getting blocked same thing goes for mikhail petrus any of those guys ready for alston no it, it is on site when it comes to the orlando magic that was the most painful playoff series that's the most painful loss period in my sports fandom i am not over 2009 let's go avenge it let's go Cavs, baby let's go that'll be fun we're gonna be in the land it'll be great <sighs> gonna be so good i can't wait to get back to cleveland big thanks to everyone that tuned in live make sure you like and subscribe click the notification bell so you know when we're going live if you're listening via podcast and you want to support us leave us a rating leave a review subscribe unsubscribe resubscribe and help cook those books if you want to join the chase downs exclusive discord chat send a screenshot that review to chase down pod at gmail.com however you choose to support us we really do appreciate it make sure you guys are staying safe out there until next time yo cats <laughs>